Great. Well, welcome, everyone. It's just wonderful to see you coming out of the cold, uh, some of us on the heels of a scavenger hunt, and I'll explain why that's the case. Um, and so, so delighted to see all of you here. My name is Leslie Stone, and I am the Director of Education and the Director for Hong Kong for the Yale China Association. And Yale China, as I hope all of you know, is a small organization with many, many programs and a lot of heart. Uh, and we, we've been around for 113 years, and our mission is to inspire Chinese and Americans to learn and serve together. And one of uh, the smaller programs that we run is a fireside chat where we come together um, every couple of weeks to reflect and take advantage of visitors from um, who have come from other places, from our partner sites especially, and Dr. Uh, Y. Chi Chi is here. Um, and uh, I will introduce her in a moment, uh, but first I wanted to make a few announcements. Um, one thing I, of course, want you to know is Dr. Chi is here as the academic advisor for one of our uh, programs, long-standing programs, called the UNA program, which is now in its 21st year. And um, that program has been, over these 21 years, bringing eight new Asia students from Hong Kong together with eight Yale College students for a themed exchange program. It's a month with two weeks here during the Chinese New Year break, and then another two weeks during the spring holiday break, the spring break for the Yale students. Uh, UNA participants, can you identify yourselves? Uh, please feel free to ask the UNA folks who are here about their experiences. And of course, Dr. Chi can talk about her experiences as uh, the academic advisor so far this year. They just arrived on Sunday, so uh, there's a little bit of jet lag, but we're doing fine. Um, Yale China is hosting a lion dance and a lunar fest on February 1st, uh, this Saturday, starting at 10 o'clock along Whitney Avenue, starting on Grove and moving up to Trumbull, is that right? Uh, there will be a lion dance and wushu dancing and that anyone who can come and see and, and participate in. Um, there is a host of workshops and activities. If you go online on our website, you'll be guided to a link there and can sign up for the workshops. They're all, actually almost all full, but there are still some openings for, kid, for people, of, children of all ages. Um, and then on February 7th, we're having a Chongsam ball uh, which will um, sell it to bring in the new year and bring together uh, the larger Yale China family. So please consider that as well. So the fireside chat, uh, well, we can now pretend we're sitting by the fireside. Uh, we'll begin. We will start with a half hour uh, presentation after I introduce Dr. Chi and then have some questions from all of you and then um, open up for more informal exchange and eating of the treats and drinks that we have here. Um, so let me tell you about Dr. Chi and her work. And one of the things that is just so wonderful about Dr. Chi's background, especially for someone who works in the education program, is that Dr. Chi is herself an educator who worked for many years at New Asia Middle School as an English teacher before that was her first career before starting her second career. And that, that a lot of her work draws from that first-hand experience. And, and that, I, you know, I just love that part of your biography. Um, Dr. Chi received her PhD in anthropology from the Chinese University in Hong Kong. And her dissertation, which is very much connected to her topic today, which is uh, trapped in the current of mobility. She will talk about China and Hong Kong cross-border families. But her dissertation explores and compares the immigration and schooling experiences of teenage children of the two largest incoming groups to Hong Kong from mainland China, that's the first group, and from South Asia, the second group. Um, her research interests include, and the theme this year for the UNO program is migration, so top of her list is also migration, education, globalization, governance, grassroots, activism, ethnicity, culture, and identity, and youth. Um, and she has new other research projects ongoing right now that include the right of abode seeker seekers in Hong Kong and at the academic achievement of ethnic minority students in Hong Kong as well. So, uh, without further ado, we get to hear uh, from Dr. Chi. So thank, thank you so you. much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. And thank you for having me. 
having me here with you to share my research on the China Hong Kong cross border families. And thank you for coming in this cold weather. Luckily, we have the fireside. <laughs> so, uh, well, some brief background Hong Kong. I hope, uh, I'm sure everybody knows where Hong Kong is. So, Hong Kong was returned to China in 1997 and become a special administrative region, SAR, uh, where one country, two systems is practiced. So, uh, by the way, this li little uh, green dot is CHK, the Chinese University of Hong Kong, where we are from, and we look forward to your visit. Uh, since 2003, more and more mainland mothers give birth in Hong Kong and get a Hong Kong ID for their children. This research, this research explores the everyday life experiences and decision makings of a group of mainland parents, predominantly mothers who stay in Hong Kong with their Hong Kong-born children and having left their spouses and sometimes forced children behind in China and returning only briefly for visa renewal. So let's have um, an overview of the chat. So we explore these questions. So why is it possible for the mainland mothers to give birth in Hong Kong and uh, get Hong Kong citizenship for their children? And why do mainland parents give birth in Hong Kong? You can give birth in Hong Kong, doesn't mean that you will. So why, why do they do that? And uh, why do they raise children in Hong Kong? They could have uh, like brought the babies back to China. And what are their lives in Hong Kong? And finally, how do they perceive the current situations in the future? So let's start with the first question. So why, why was it suddenly possible for uh, mainland parents to give birth in Hong Kong and get an ID for their children? And in fact, it was made possible because of three policies. The first one, the individual visa scheme, which was implemented in the year 2003. The second, the initiative to develop Hong Kong into a medical hub in 2008 and 2003 as well. And the Court of Final Appeal giving the Hong Kong born Chinese citizens are entitled the right of vote in Hong Kong. And in July 2003, the individual visa scheme was implemented to allow mainland travelers to visit Hong Kong on an individual basis. And before that, mainland visitors could only go in groups. But why 2003? Any idea what happened there? So uh, the scheme was first introduced in four Guangdong cities and gradually expanded to other regions. Currently, we have 49 mainland cities. And the aim, in fact, was to boost the sluggish economy, especially tourism. After SARS in 2003, SARS uh, was a vital epidemic disease, and which claimed 300 lives in, in Hong Kong. Then in 2008, Hong Kong was struck by the global financial tsunami. And re in response, the Hong Kong government promoted six priority industries, including the medical industry, but, but talking medical care was a major expansion in the private, private, uh, uh, private uh, medical sector. In 2003, let me give you some idea about how much it cost to give birth in Hong Kong. A maternity package in public hospitals for two nights and three days for non-locals cost 10,000 Hong Kong dollars. That's roughly 1,300 US. And then in 2005, the fee was doubled to 20,000 Hong Kong dollars. Then in 2007, the charge was further raised to 39,000. The high fee was partly aimed at screening out low-income families. The individual business scheme and the medical hub development were primarily economic policies, but they also opened up a door for mainland pregnant women to give birth in Hong Kong. They could end Hong Kong on an individual travel um, basis and then make an appointment with a doctor. One or two weeks before the estimated date of the delivery, the doctor's appointment would entitle them to enter Hong Kong for childbirth. Hong Kong born mainland babies can get citizenship in Hong Kong because of a court ruling in 2001 that Hong Kong born uh, Chinese uh, citizens, regardless of the citizenship status of their parents, are entitled to write a vote in Hong Kong. It is worth noting that once a baby gets a Hong Kong ID, it is not eligible for the Wukou or household registration in mainland, and it is not transferable. We'll get back into this in a, in a moment. So, with 
the opening up of channels to give birth in Hong Kong. The number of these mainland babies born in Hong Kong climbed, as you can see from the figures, from about 620 in 2001. Then gradually to about 2000 in 2003, and then to more than 35,000 in year 2011. The accumulated number totals nearly 200,000. And the trend was abruptly brought to us part in April 2001, when Hong Kong Chief Executive, in response to public outcry in Hong Kong, announced a zero quota policy to stop Chinese mainlanders giving birth in Hong Kong, uh, mainly in public hospitals. And in 2012, around 60,000 mainland pregnant women were intercepted and controlled points of which 4,000 without prior booking uh, for hospitals were refused entry. And the information was also passed on to the mainland authorities to prevent them from seeking emergency ex uh, admission to local hospitals. And then um, the mothers in this research gave birth in Hong Kong before the enforcement of the zero quota policy and are staying in Hong Kong on temporary visas with the Hong Kong born children uh, who go to school in Hong Kong. I basically work with 45 families, but I work closer with 24 of them. By working closer, I mean I had home visits and at least one in-depth interview with the mother. This paper focuses on these 24 families. Methods include participant observation, group meetings, individual visits, uh, interviews, and home visits. So let me give you some uh, information about my informants. More than 70% of them come from Canton province. It makes sense because, um, first of all, Canton is close to Hong Kong, and the individual business scheme was first implemented in Guangdong City. And the second largest group in my uh, uh, informants is from Hainan. The age of the mothers. The ages ranges from 28 to 50, with an average at 38. And on average, they have been staying in Hong Kong for three years. About half of them are married, one third are divorced, and the rest are widowed, unmarried, or have lost contact with the fathers of the children. About 40% have one child, 40% two children, and 20% three. The average age of the first children is 10, the second eight, and the third six. So let's look at the places of birth of the children. Most first and second children were born in Hong Kong, and all the third children were born in Hong Kong. As you can see, about half of them are on welfare, and about 24%, about 20 are still applying. So let's look at this question, why give birth in Hong Kong? So we can say that China and Hong Kong uh, cross-border cross families are partly a product of government policies and sociocultural factors. As I have mentioned before, certain Hong Kong policies have opened up an avenue for mainland mothers to give birth in Hong Kong. These policies include the implementation of the individual scheme, uh, business scheme, the initiative to develop Hong Kong into a medical hub, and the right of birth registration. And certain factors encourage mainland mothers uh, to give birth in Hong Kong. The mainland one-child policy together with the traditional Chinese thought that favors sons over daughters is a major driving force. There are several scenarios. So first, when prenatal ultrasound scan shows that the first baby is a girl, the parents give birth in Hong Kong so as to avoid a mainland record in order to reserve the quota for a second child with hope that it will be a boy. The second scenario is that the couple has a daughter but it's under family or social pressure to have a son. So they give birth to the second child in Hong Kong to evade the one-child policy. While there is concession in uh, rural areas, the couples whose first child is a daughter can have a second child, there's the condition that they must wait for uh, from three to five years. Contraception is 
mandatory. Some couples are worried that after all those years, the wife will become overaged for um, pregnancy, meaning difficulties in both conception and delivery. Uh, let me share one example with you. An informant whom I call Ayun. Ayun is one example. She got married at the age of 33 and gave birth to a baby girl when she was 35. Her rural background entitled her to have a second child. But seeing that she will be 40 after five years, which she thought would be too late, she did not practice contraception as required. One year later, she found herself pregnant with a boy. Since she did not have a birth permit, she went to Hong Kong to give birth. Another case is Agua. She was eight months pregnant with her second over quarter child when she was taken by the family planning bureau to the hospital waiting for a forced abortion. She ran away from the hospital but did not return home. And finally, with the help of a relative, went to Hong Kong to give birth. The third situation is that the mother has one child but has an unplanned pregnancy and the mother could not bear to have abortion or physically unfit to undergo abortion. Artung is an example. She had a son and did not plan to have any more children, but she got pregnant and could not bear to have abortion. She gave birth in Hong Kong. Yet another situation is that the couples are not married and do not have a birth permit. Generally speaking, giving birth in Hong Kong has become a means for mainland Chinese parents to evade the one-child policy. And the entrance to the border was opened up by the policies that we have just mentioned. So Hong Kong people sometimes question these parents as violating state policy, abusing the loopholes, and buying privileges. While this may be true to some extent, we need to understand the one-child policy as a state imposition which, which may not necessarily fit the social and cultural practices of the Chinese society. There, um, well, uh, in general, a large family is considered a blessing and sons are valued as continuation of the family. This has brought about many problems, including selective abortion, forced abortion, and infanticide. Even today, more than 30 years after the implementation of uh, the policy, son preference is still common, especially in rural areas and families with low education background. The older generation always hoped to have sons to continue the family line. According to, the, to my informants, those families without a son may be looked down upon or even bullied by friends and relatives and be insulted as one generation stuff, which means having no successions. The family and social pressures experienced by these women are the everyday rea realities that are far more imminent than state policies. Uh, when they saw or heard that a fellow townsman or friend successfully gave birth in Hong Kong, and was not conceded over quota, they would just follow. Some were also further encouraged by their friends and relatives in Hong Kong and in China. So from the perspective of a parent, one major initiative of giving birth in Hong Kong is that it entails a path for going beyond China and for moving up socially. In fact, China's economic reform and opening in 1978 since then, growing, oh, uh, sorry, going overseas has been a widely shared aspiration among Chinese people. Grassroots parents, from, like, those in my parent, as, like those in my paper, are bitterly aware that they lack opportunities because of low education, and particularly desire that their children can have good education. And a Hong Kong idea is like a chance to enable their children to not only have our rural urban mobilities, but also potential international mobilities to go beyond China. It also uh, means access to quiet education for our social mobility. Even low-income families are prepared to spend all the savings and take out loans here and there to give birth in Hong Kong. So the question is why raise children in Hong Kong so they could give birth in Hong Kong and then go back to live uh, in China. Uh, well, three, there are three possible scenarios after the baby is born. So the first one is the whole family stay in Hong Kong, but this choice is only possible for the very resourceful families because of the high cost of living in Hong Kong. 
And then the second scenario is the whole family stay in mainland China. But then, as we'll uh, see later, they face the issues of having no who call the household registration, which means the children are denied proper education and medical care. And if the children stay in Hong Kong, they have to cross the border every day. And the third scenario is that the children stay in Hong Kong and the parents stay in mainland China. This seems to be the most flexible strategy for low-income families, and yet there are some other issues. The group in this paper um, are those who have chosen to stay in Hong Kong with the mother um, staying here to take care of the child. So after the children are born in Hong Kong, the parents usually first take them back to hometown. The, no, the low income families, this research knew that they, it was it be very hard for the whole family to uh, afford the cost of living in Hong Kong. So therefore, their initial plan was that to bring up the children in mainland until the, child reach, until the children reach teenage and can take care of themselves. Then uh, they could return to Hong Kong on their own for education. That, that was usually the original plan. And the, and the parents also hope that by that time, the family economic situation would improve. However, when the children reached the school age, the parents found that they face a discrepancy between planning and reality. And the most common problem they faced was uh, that when they decide to give birth in Hong Kong, they see only the benefits of a Hong Kong ID card, but generally they underestimate the disadvantage of not having a hukong. The China Economic uh, Weekly estimates that about 30 million mainlanders do not have a hukong. Many of them are second or third children without um, a hukong. So they do not have access to very edu education, medical care, or, or other welfare. They cannot apply for higher education entrance exam either. The grassroots parents have a low education and did not think about all this carefully enough. Neither did they have accurate information about different policies. Many of them just took the advice from friends and relatives or did the same when they saw some fellow townsmen successfully uh, gave birth in Hong Kong and got an ID for their children. It, it was only when they started to look for a school place in mainland China did they realize the school fee was way beyond their financial capacities? Some families in this research also unexpectedly were haunted by a huge fine for violating the one child policy. The fines vary from place to place and from time to time and could be sky high for most families. Take Shenzhen as an example. Since 2013, Shenzhen Parliament residents have faced fines of at least about 2,000, 19,000 yuan, that is roughly 36,000 US dollars, for giving, for giving birth to a second baby, whether in Hong Kong or, or, or overseas. The amount is six times the city's average annual income last year. The fine is much higher for rich people. The most famous example would be the Chinese film director, Jiang Yumao. He was fined <laughs> <laughs> seven points sorry, 7.48 million yuan, and that is 1.2 million US dollars for having three children. And, and in fact, the policy was very confusing for my informants. According to them, whether children born in Hong Kong uh, are considered over quota or not, varies in different places in different times. Some said that at the time they gave birth, um, people born outside China were not considered over quota. But this changed when more and more people had their children born in Hong Kong and elsewhere. While some uh, village committees turned a blind eye to this, the Family Planning Bureau in some places demanded a heavy fine. Again, I'll give you one uh, example from an informant, Agai. Agai unfortunately faced brutal law enforcement of the family planning officials who dealt Akai's family for five of hundreds of thousands of renminbi. Akai said that the uh, officials dismantled the door and the roof of her house in order to press her. Her husband ran away to work in another province, and Akai hid here and there with her two children. 
and to force our client to turn herself in, the Family Planning Bureau detained her mother and her sister-in-law who lived in the same village and found the archive right to Hong Kong. In other cases, unexpected changes like a failed marriage or financial difficulties also make it impossible for my informants to adhere to their original plan. Atun has mentioned about uh, have an, had an unexpected second child. After the baby was born in Hong Kong, they returned to live in their hometown. When a child went to school, he had to pay double the school fee as high as uh, 1,300 yuan. The couple could barely maintain a family with a household in income of 3,000 yuan. They become even worse off when unfortunately the husband was injured on the work and the income, and the income shall be decreased. Other unexpected changes include the untimely, untimely death of husband, the running away of, of husband because of a gambling debt, or a divorce without alimony. These families usually have very limited resources and could hardly make ends meet when facing sudden changes. In yet other situations, the babies were born with a serious medical problem. For example, Alphan's daughter was born with, with a heart problem and had to undergo surgery once or twice a year. There was no way that Alphan could afford them expensive medical, medical expenses in mainland China without medical coverage. But a child is entitled to public health care in Hong Kong. And moreover, the medical care in Hong Kong is generally more advanced. Another example, Aping. Aping's daughter has autism. Uh, the child went to school in the mainland for two years. But Aping found that there was a serious shortage of uh, school places for special education. The fees were high, but the quality was not guaranteed. According to Arpin, the instructor had that the students follow her to speak aloud some words, and when her daughter did not say anything, the instructor pressed the child's nose with force to make her open her mouth to say something. And Arpin questioned how this might work, and the instructor replied, this had always been the approach. And Arpin later took her daughter to Hong Kong for a course and was glad to see improvement. So in order to, for, their do for, uh, for, sorry, for her daughter to get appropriate learning support, Alvin decided to stay in Hong Kong with her daughter. Then, how are their lives in Hong Kong? So facing the difficulties <laughs> in mainland China, Hong Kong seemed to offer hope. However, these parents only knew that it was hard for them to live in mainland China, but knew very little about lives in Hong Kong. They were just taking one step at a time without a clear picture of what the following, following steps would be. After living in Hong Kong for some time, they discovered it was just as difficult for them. A mother described her move from mainland China to Hong Kong as jumping from hell into a fire pit. The mothers felt physically and mentally exhausted um, by problems including housing, income, visa, parenting, split family, and discrimination by Hong Kong people. Uh, and they lack social network and support. So we'll briefly talk about each of these problems. The biggest problem these mainland mothers encounter is housing. Very often, these mothers went to Hong Kong with their children when they got their friends or relatives agreed to let them stay on a short-term basis. In the beginning, the two families usually could get along well, okay, but conflicts arose as time passed. Even married siblings of the mothers uh, find it difficult to have extra members live under the same roof. What makes, what makes things worse was that most of these mothers had to take out loans from others, and their friends and relatives gradually avoided them because of their loans. For example, Abo and her two younger children, aged three and five, lived in a relative's home, where the children saw that the 10-year-old son of the relative had something good or interesting to play. They asked for the same. They, uh, this usually results in quarrels, first among the children and then later among the adults. Abo could do nothing but try her best to keep her children away 
When the relative son returned home after school, Abu took her children to a park and did not return until 7 or 8 p.m. She would then make dinner, um, bathe the kids, did household chores, and went to sleep late every day. Other mothers faced even greater difficulties. Alam experienced sexual harassment from a relative but could only suffer in silence since she was living in this place. It is far too difficult for these mothers to move away from their relatives. The rocket high rent in Hong Kong is beyond their financial limit. Moreover, they have no Hong Kong ID or a steady income and have young children. Landlords are not willing to rent their flats to them. For those who do rent a flat, the best you can afford is a tiny room known as a subdivided flat or Taofong in Hong Kong. So I've got some pictures here. This is the home of her father and his five-year-old daughter. She have, um, the daughter has to do homework on the bed because it's very small. And then another picture. This is the bedroom of two mothers and their three children. They put mattress on the, f on the floor and five of them sleep together on the floor because well, there's not enough space for bed. And because the flats are so small, it is typical to have the, child, uh, to have the kitchen and toilet together like this. It's also uh, usually where they hand their laundry to dry. The picture on the left, like the small shelf about the toilet seat, is where the mother cooks. That place. And another big problem is the financial pressure. This mother who are in Hong Kong on two-way permits or tourist visas are not allowed to work. It is difficult for the husbands who work in um, mainland China to support the high cost of living in Hong Kong. These women face tremendous constraints when applying for social welfare, known as uh, Comprehensive Social Security Assistance, or CSSA in Hong Kong. The mothers are not eligible because they don't have an ID, and only the children are, but the policy tightened in 2008. Children who are aged below 18 and born to non-Hong Kong permanent residents could no longer submit an independent application. Instead, they must apply on a household basis with guardians who are Hong Kong permanent residents and um, also CSASA recipients. This practice is local known as living and receiving together. Meaning that the, the guardians must be receiving CSSA and living together with the children. So what well, you can see is very difficult. The cross uh, border mothers in this research hardly have any Hong Kong locals as friends. It is extremely dif difficult for them to find the right guardians. Even if they come across a suitable guardian, he or she is usually reluctant to help. First, CSA, CSSA recipients as a rule live in crowded living conditions. It is, there's hardly extra room for a mother and her children. Second, people are daunted by the potential troubles for uh, like undergoing income and asset tests again, or the responsibility to handle social welfare documents and interviews relating to the children. Some potential guardians also do not trust the mothers and fear they have to bear the responsibilities to anything happens to children. Third, there is a very critical concern that the guardian would in fact get less if a child applies with him or her because the calculation of CSSA uh, is regressive, meaning that the average amount of, uh, for each recipient in the same household reduces with an additional member. The rationale is that certain household utilities can be shared. In 2012, this co-residency co requirement was relaxed, but even when the mother finds a guardian, problems still exist. Naturally, the guardian demands that he or she will not get less than his or her original amount, which means the child will get less, a smaller share. On top of this, most guardians expect a few hundred uh, dollars every month from mother as a, uh, as a gesture of gratitude. Life is tough when both the mother and child live on the reduced share uh, of the child. This is locally known as living on the children, or which means, oh, this is a pun in Cantonese, 
literally means eating a small clay pot of rice or eating rice boiled in the sun. And life is more miserable when a guardian unlawfully withholds the child's CSSA. And visa application is also very exhausting. Most of these mothers are in Hong Kong on an exit entry visa with an endorsement for visiting relatives. relatives. Uh, commonly known as a two-way two -way permit, which they obtain from the mainland Public Security Bureau Office of their Hong Kong. This allows them to stay in Hong Kong for three months, and they must return to a place of Hong Kong to renew their visa when it expires. A standard renewal takes about one to two weeks. During this period, some mothers may leave their children to the care of friends and relatives in Hong Kong, some may have had their mainland families come over to Hong Kong to take care of the children. When no one can um, take care of the children, the mothers have to take the children together with them, and the children are forced to miss class. In order to return to Hong Kong as soon as possible, the mother will have to apply for express visa, but in some places, uh, corrupt officials take advantage of this. One common trick is that the Bureau does not accept direct application and it must be done through an intermediary, which in fact is an excuse for demanding red packets about ranging from one to three thousand plus yuan. The mothers find the mainland visa policy is extremely confusing. For instance, according to one mother, the Public Security Bureau officer um, required that every time when she renewed her visa, she had to take her daughter with her as, a, as proof. But then, um, for the experience of another mother was just exactly the opposite. When she took her daughter with her for a visa renewal, the officer said that since her daughter was already with her and not in Hong Kong, she had no reason to apply a two-way permit to visit a relative in Hong Kong. And sometimes the mothers are anxious to get a visa quick but do not want to pay the extra red packet, then they apply for individual visa. But this entitles only a short stay of not more than seven, seven days each time. That means they have to apply the, for the visa once every week. It's a waste of time and travel fares. And moreover, their frequent entries make them very suspicious in the eyes of the Hong Kong Immigration Department. And many of them uh, have the experience of being interrogated for hours at entering Hong Kong. Okay, okay. So pro prolonged family separation may lead to moral dilemma, guilt, and indebtedness. First and foremost, marriage may fail. Second, the women also feel deeply guilty about not taking care of their husbands, parents, and elder mainland children. For instance, while Archie was in Hong Kong with her younger child, her elder daughter on the mainland was doing worse and worse in school, and Archie could do nothing but worry. She blamed herself for not fulfilling the duty of her mother and for um, <coughs> making her elder daughter into a very difficult situation. Another mother, Akwai, was in Hong Kong with her younger daughter, leaving her husband and elder son behind in mainland China. Every time she returned to mainland China with her daughter, her son was very happy. But the day before Akwai was to go back to Hong Kong, the son always picked on the daughter until she cried. The son would say, days were so good before sister was born. This was extremely hurtful to the mother. She told me that when the daughter got older, she would return to her hometown to take good care of her son as compensation. But sorrowfully, she added, oh, my son in no longer need me by then. So with no family in Hong Kong, these mainland mothers desperately need a supportive social network, unfortunately. They are often the friends and relatives avoid them, as we have mentioned, and then they also experience a rather hostile contest of reception. In the midst of its critical post-colonial transformations, Hong Kong has seen a surge of anti-China sentiments. These mainland parents are usually the easy targets. Although they have
have, um, although the babies are legally Hong Kong permanent residents, public discourses reject them on the ground that they have acquired a status through an immoral way. And the parents are not Hong Kong citizens and hence do not have the right to give birth in Hong Kong, etc., etc. And then uh, there's a general perception that mainland pregnant women do not have prior booking at local hospitals but rush into the emergency room in the last moment. This is local known as rushing the gate. So the people with uh, the local people will see them as irresponsible parents. And the Hong Kong citizens dub mainland Chinese locusts for their aggressive aggressiveness and for snatching social welfare. And the Hong Kong born babies are known as double knots, strong fei. And there are other terms, including a second category children, which is used by the statistics department, or the Hong Kong people beyond anticipation used by the last media sometimes. And the term double knots is in reinterpreted as neither talent nor wealth. Fei type. Okay, type to the type. Um, I'm sure you have seen this poster. Mm -hmm. It happened in 2012 to the big mainlanders as locusts. So the poster reads, would you like to see Hong Kong spend $1 million every 18 minutes on children non-Hong Kongers? Hong Kongers have had enough. We demand stopping the invasion of Hong Kong by mainland pregnant women. And there are some other negative comments from the internet. So like the first one, mainland women should be completely banned from coming to Hong Kong to give birth. They have no contribution but take away our resources. They're simply obstacles in our ways. So they are under immense pressure but lack support. <laughs> and a lot of them experience uh, emotional problems. For example, one mother said to me, many times I cried nightmares until I'm awakened by my own wit. I found my face all wet with tears. I used to look down upon those people who commit suicide, judging them they are too weak. But now I understand. When you are stuck at a dead end, you will really only think about death. Another mother said, sometimes my son makes noise. The relatives whom we are staying with are annoyed. I talk to my son, but he's too young to understand. He's only three. I hit him and he cries even louder. Once I went totally crazy as he cried and cried. To make him stop crying, I pressed my hands on his throat. I covered his mouth with a blanket. I even threw him into the rubbish bin. Then I held him tight in my arms and we both cried our hearts out. I really collapsed. Several times I saw no hope. I only wanted to jump off a building with my two kids. So then, what about their current situations and the futures? How do they perceive that? So they understand that the current situation in Hong Kong um, is full of moral dilemma and indebtedness. So when I talk with them, they talk about, like, they talk about um, whether they are irresponsible parents or not. They emphasize that they never never thought about being an irresponsible parents. They're, they're staying in Hong Kong exactly because they are responsible. They, they're trying to get the best for their children. In fact, when I talk with these mainland mothers about the future, they told me they have hopes for their children, but not themselves. They said there was no, uh, there were so many uncertainties and so many things that are beyond their control that it was meaningless for them to think about their future. So first of all, settling in Hong Kong is out of the question. The current in immigration policy uh, uh, requires that people from mainland China who wish to settle in Hong Kong must first apply for one-way permit. And the daily quota is 150. The only way for these mainland mothers to apply is to wait until they are 60 years old and then apply under the category of unsupported elderly parent. So that means they have to wait decades. And these mothers are troubled by everyday difficulties and they do not want to think so much. As one mother said, um, I used to think a lot but could never figure things out no matter how hard I thought. Now I try not to think about it. As soon as I started thinking, all sorts of thoughts come to my mind and I just can't stop. 
I may worry whether my husband is well in our hometown. I may suspect whether he does something unfaithful. Unfaithful. I, 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 of course, I'm also anxious about living expenses. Whenever I think of about all this, my brain never stops. I just lie in the bed the whole night with my eyes wide open until daybreak. So when I ask whether they would return to live on the mainland, they were highly ambivalent. The general understanding is that going back means um, making their own lives better at the expense of the children's future. If they stay, it means they are sacrificing themselves to benefit their children's development. So uh, while some parents say that life here is tough, life in Hong Kong is tough, but it's worth it for the children, as this mother said. I'm pleased to have my daughter getting an education in Hong Kong. When we go back to our hometown, she's noticeably more polite and better behaved than her mainland peers. When she sees people jumping the queue or littering, she disapproves of their behaviors. However, some mothers regret deeply giving birth in Hong Kong and feel there's no way out. As um, another mother said, if I could choose again, I would definitely not come to Hong Kong to give birth. People say that we're double nose. I feel I'm neither here nor there. I fell into this path. There's no way back. There's no way out. So I would like to um, conclude briefly. Mainland mothers giving birth in Hong Kong seem to be taking advantage of both places. The Hong Kong born children get citizenship which enables them to have access to quality education, medical care, and other social welfare. The couple can have more than one child, which is a privilege over many mainland parents. However, ironically, at the same time, these mothers find themselves trapped between two places with many obstacles. Their experiences inspire us to rethink these two issues. The first issue is parental decision making. While the choice is made by the parents, it is the children who bear the consequences so what is intended does not always work out. Well, I'm planning to develop this research into a longitudinal study to explore what affect potential decision making among um, parents as the children grow and how they make sense of their choices. The second issue that we may need to rethink is the workings of inclusion or exclusion as demonstrated by Hong Kong society towards mainland mothers. How far is it our moral obligation to help others who are from societies? They may not offer adequate protection to human rights. Why is procreative a privilege? Well, it is uh, just taken for granted in most places in, in, uh, in the world. If procreation is a basic human right, do we have the moral obligations to open up a channel for mainland mothers to, to give birth in Hong Kong or other places? So I will well, really appreciate your feedback in my research. Thank you. Okay. Uh, really interesting talk. I know there must be many questions here, so I will open the floor up immediately for, for questions. Yeah. Um, so uh, when I was in Los Angeles, I worked for a TV station that we did a story about how when Hong Kong tightened its law, these pregnant tourists came to the United States to give birth to American citizen babies and during our months of investigation we got the feeling that these parents are very wealthy. They spend tens of thousands of dollars in medical care, shopping, tourism. When they bring back the kids, they go to international school. It's like it's very different from what you have yes. described. Right. So with with all these problems that you have just told us, is this only ex like exclusive to you know low yes, income? Yes, low income families. Mm -hmm. right. So, so like, we can see different <coughs> strategies and work by different families. Mm -hmm. So for the wealthy families, like they are like they are just problem free, is it? Well, uh, I think for the more resourceful families, they can easily solve the problems. At least they don't have to face all these problems. Like uh, many of the uh, well-off mainland families, they can, the whole family can just move to Hong Kong. Like under the investment migration scheme, it's much easier for them if they don't care about the money. To piggyback what she just said, uh, what's the percentage of mother who gave birth in Hong Kong? is the group that you just described? Uh, well, I don't have the statistics, 
but um, I really don't know well, what what's the rough percentage. But I guess the low income family stay in Hong Kong, it may not be too big a group. I'm thinking about in terms of a few hundred. Oh, okay. Because I have the same impression mm -hmm. with hers. Mm -hmm. Our, you know, I'm from mainland China. Mm -hmm. My impression is people who are wealthy who could afford to travel to Hong Kong mm -hmm. to find a hospital to give birth there and to comfortably coming back. Um, so my second question is, um, is probably out of the study that is I know, like how many people who gave birth there and then go back to mainland China? And why do these people not wanting to go back? I know you talked about how they didn't want to. What will they be facing if they go back? If not, if here is so terrible that they think about suicide, right. then why not go back? What could be worse than that? Well, when they go back, they face other problems, like the, they have no hukuko, then that, that means they have uh, children will have to pay a higher school fee, sometimes, uh, which, which is beyond their financial uh, uh, capacities. And then, at least in Hong Kong, they, the children can apply for CSSA, but then in mainland China, there's no welfare coverage. Yeah, because there's no... Welfare. Yeah, and also, right, and also they may face the fine because of violating the one-child policy, which can be thousands of yuan. Thank you. I just have a couple of questions. I'm sorry for my ignorance. You talked about birth permit, and you mentioned in your example how there was a mother from rural area who had birth permit to have a second child, and then you also mentioned how someone had the birth permit for only one child. So if you can talk a little bit about that. But also I was curious about, you know, how many, um, what's the age span in terms of like how long do these families stay in Hong Kong? Like, mm. do, do the kids go through a middle school or high school, mm. and what happens then? Or is that your longitudinal study that you're talking right. about a little bit later? Right. Because and, you know, I mean, you know, where is the end point? Because <coughs> parents still are not Hong Kong citizens, right? I mean, mm. the, the child would only mm. have a, a permit to live there and stuff. So right. what's the what's the benefit, I guess, when they when they have to go to college and they don't need their parents anymore, or maybe they don't want to support them anymore financially? So, uh, well, these mainland mothers come only in large number after around 2005, as you can see mm -hmm. uh, the chart. So, um, we, we are yet to see what will happen to those children. Now the children, mm -hmm. most of them are still in primary school. Mm -hmm. Most of the, the children, because they only started a few years ago. So we have yet to see. Mm -hmm. And then, um, for the birth permit, in order to give birth in mainland China, you, you need to get a birth permit first. Mm -hmm. Because, well, it's one way to enforce the one child policy. Mm -hmm. So, if you don't have the birth permit, that means you cannot get a hukou. But really. how come some people have a birth, birth permit for a second child? Oh, uh, well, when, if they give birth in Hong Kong, oh, no one yeah. will ask for the birth yeah. permit. Okay. We have the, the two systems. And, uh, I'm sorry, um, Dominic. You know, what happens, I'm assuming, you mentioned that there are pregnant women who come to Hong Kong to deliver. I mean, what happens at the border? I mean, obviously, do, do the border officials fear? I mean, once they see them pregnant, are they going to overstay if, they, if they're there for a week? Or so it depends it? on uh, when okay. we were talking about, because the policy changed. Like in 2003, actually, they were encouraged to go to Hong Kong to give birth. Because at that time, the government was thinking about developing Hong Kong into a medical hub and expanding the maternal service was one of the major focus. Sure. So and it also, uh, well, things also changed around 2006 when a lot of Hong Kong mothers started to complain that it was increasingly difficult for them to have a booking. And then finally in 2012, the government stopped it altogether. And it has caused other problems actually because some private hospitals had already expanded in order to uh, yeah, to serve these mothers, and now they face problems. Sure. They, they, they were losing money because of that, and they, they complained to the government, but that's another issue. Can you talk a little bit how, about how you met your informants? Mm -hmm. uh, basically, I um, uh, worked with them through a very small NGO, and well, maybe I should mention a little bit here, these mothers lack uh, social support in Hong Kong because, as far as I know, only a very small underfunded NGO uh, 
I think this is the only one which specializes in service, servicing uh, these mothers, mainly because it's difficult to persuade donors to donate money for the NGOs because of the uh, general anti-China government. So people are not willing to donate money if, if, they, if they tell them, okay, we are servicing the mainland mothers. And uh, so this small NGO, they have regular meetings with the mothers, so I joined the meetings at once every week. Usually they have a meeting once every week where the, they bring the mothers, bring the children. Usually it's a Saturday morning. The mother bring the children, so we divide into two groups. The mothers will have a um, um, sharing group, uh, and then the children will have a um, homework help small group. And then finally, I, when we get better, uh, when we know each other better, then I have individual visit to their homes and talk to them. Yes, one more question. Uh, feel comfortable if you don't come or answer this, it's okay. I was just curious, um, I don't know if you were born in Hong Kong. I was. What do you think of these people? Oh, okay, so it's a... Well, like from mm. the perspective of a native Hong Kong looking at these mm. mothers, either mm. low socioeconomic status or high, just in general. Mm. What do you think of this phenomenon that happened and then developed into the way it is now? Right, right. I think uh, uh, these mothers are like easy targets. They well somehow I think the anti Chinese and uh, the anti China uh, sorry, sorry, anti China center in Hong Kong is targeting towards more the Chinese government. Somehow it is unfairly projected onto this group, and they are the easy group because they are the weak groups. So and very often, um, the pro, um, I mean, uh, the sometimes the mass media or the internet may sensationalize their uh, situation, like ex exaggerating that they are snatching resources from Hong Kong or taking away the uh, school places, etc. And for example, when you talk about school places, I think the government has more to blame because. You cannot expect people to just come, spend money, to give birth and then go away, right? It should be part of your planning that at least some of them may be staying. And then it's not difficult for them to estimate the number, but then they do not seem to have a, a good plan to get prepared for that. Thank you. I don't see any more questions, but we will be here. Uh, we will continue to be here for um, at least uh, 15 minutes or so. There are treats. I did want to make one last announcement. Um, the students who are um, here from New Asia College will be continuing the conversation with, about uh, Hong Kong and migration tomorrow and the following day at Loose Auditorium starting at 3.30. Uh, on tomorrow and then again on um, Thursday. Thursday. But before uh, we disband, I would give a really oh, wonderful thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. This topic is, is such uh, a timely topic for um, all of us who spend time looking at, at Hong Kong and knowing that not just this issue, but so many issues like this are a part of what is happening in Hong Kong. Please also stay and look at the exhibit, which is, um, to has a little touches upon uh, cross-border issues. And finally, we will do our drawing for uh, the winner of the, we have to thank our sponsor, the Shenzhen Kodori Company. Uh, and uh, at each fireside chat, we do a drawing to, uh, for uh, the winning uh, ticket. So I think uh, Dr. Uh, draw the, the ticket. See who wins today. Nucky one. one, as you bring out your ticket number two, three, six, one, four, seven. Oh. Ah! So you'll have to come this way, and then finally we have one more gift. Um, we want to present to uh, Dr. G our, um, which we call this our centennial book, and it um, has the history of Yale China up to about 2000. One, uh, and then you can go on our website for the rest of it. We're so grateful to you for coming and for being nice fireside chat.